It is indeed a privilege and an honor to be able to worship our Lord on such a time as this because most of us know that this season is all about reflecting upon the birth of our Savior. And if it had not been for his birth, amen, we would not be who we are today. So let's thank God for Jesus. Come on, give it up for him. Amen. Well, we're going to have a word of prayer, and we're going to get right into the word of God. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much for who you are in our lives. We thank you for all of those that have gathered and all of those that are gathering around their television stream or their Wi-Fi, uh, however they are connecting with us today, Lord. We thank you so much for this day. We thank you, Lord, that not only this day, but each and every day, we want to, God, reflect upon the greatest gift that you have given unto mankind, and that is in your Son, Jesus Christ. And we love you, and we praise you, and we appreciate you, and we believe that it is so. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's people shout amen. 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 Well, how many really enjoy Christmas? Amen. How many really, really enjoy this time? Amen. And you know, when you think about this time, it's a special time because we're able to come together, amen, not only with family, but with friends and church members and just have time to reflect upon the year and look at all that God has done all year long in our lives. And uh, yesterday, I picked up my granddaughter uh, because she was part of a marriage renewal of vow, and uh, Sarah and myself was riding, and uh, we were admiring all of the Christmas decoration that we saw all throughout their neighborhood and every neighborhood that we drove through. And uh, of course, I said, Sarah, uh, uh, we can both identify that something is missing. And, and I, I said, Sarah, what, is, what do we notice and what are we not noticing in a lot of the Christmas decoration? She said, Papa, uh, I don't see uh, the manger. I don't see uh, the nativity scene in a lot of our decoration today. I said, baby, that's a good observation. And even when you go into the malls and into the public places, they have now removed the nativity scene and the manger scene from the setting. Because when we look at it, it is really slowly, amen, trying to remove Christ from Christmas. And uh, I, I believe that if we allow ourselves uh, to embrace that, it's going to set things up so that one day we will have a generation that will be celebrating Christmas, but without Christ. And uh, this morning, I, I want to go to St. Luke, amen, and we want to spend some time here in St. Luke, amen, the second chapter and uh, I want to talk on this subject for a few moments. Amen. I want to talk about the message of the manger. The message of the manger. Because I, I, I really think that when you look at the manger, it is not only a part of Christmas, but it's the heart. Of Christmas. It's the heart because it's all about his birth. And when we remove Christ from, amen, his original place in society and in our, in our lives, what we have is a time where people are just giving gift to one another and a lot of partying going on 
but not a lot of recognition and acknowledgement of who Christ is. And, and I think we've got to relook at Christmas ought to be an exciting time. It should be a time that we enjoy friends and families and co-workers and, you know, just enjoy and reflect on life, but never at the expenses of removing Christ from the equation. Because he he got to be the most important thing about this time that we celebrate. A lot of time we make Christmas about what we can give to one another of what we don't give to one another without thinking about what he has given unto us all. Come on, somebody. And uh, we have to look And as we look into the heart of the manger, there's a message. And and I want to bring out about three points or three things that have stood out uh, in my studies of that. But let's get started here. And uh, I want to start at uh, verse number one. And we're going to read down. And uh, do we have a reader here this morning? Amen. Amen. Ella Travis, can you grab the mic, please? Amen. And let me just kind of work through some things and bring out some things. And uh, you can have a seat. And let's just start at uh, verse number, for the sake of time, start at verse number 7. And I want you to read down to verse number 12 for me, please. That's St. Luke, the second chapter. And uh, if we can pull it up from the New King James, uh, and just go ahead, and uh, let's flow right there, guys. Amen. And she brought forth her firstborn son, uh-huh. and wrapped him in swaddling cloth, right, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, notice the Bible says, and Mary brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloth or claws, because if you know anything about this, this was straps or remaining from an original garment. She took the straps and put them together, and she wrapped him and laid him in a manger. Now, I've got to challenge us to think untraditional this morning, because when you look at Bethlehem, Bethlehem was a small village that was made up of stone. The majority of the building and the surrounding was composed of a lot of stonery. And it was like a fortress. And watch this. What we understand about an inn is not what they encountered. This wasn't an inn like the Holiday Inn. It wasn't an inn like the Ramada Inn. It was really a concrete wall that was separated and a part where families would come in and dwell through the night. It wasn't all the comfort that we know. And and watch this. Uh, So there was no room In the end, and all of this is by design, is by default, that it was an end in the room. Because the Bible says in Isaiah 53, it says his comedy was not common as we know. So he was never supposed to be born in royalty, although he was royal. He was supposed to have been born in a place that every man, whether you are rich or poor, could identify with his coming. And the Bible said, and they laid him in a manger. Now, let me paint another picture for you. This manger, scholars have said that the manger was not so much a wooden trough as it was a stone, uh, it was a stone hole in the wall where 
the animals was dwelling and it was like a feeding trough. And therefore, they took straw and they patted it down and they laid him in a manger. Now, I'm going to get somewhere with this. Uh, but watch this. The manger was not in the walls. It was out in the open. Because in those days, the livestock was kept in the center of the city in the open so the public could see it. In other words, Christ coming into the world was never supposed to be a secret event, but a public event. Because he didn't come for a particular group, but he came for all people. Come on, somebody. And, and, and the Bible said they laid him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. Okay, there was no room in the inn. Uh-huh, keep that in mind. Keep reading, Elder Travis. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields. Uh-huh. Keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, there was in the same country shepherds in the field, watch this, living out in the field, keeping watch over, the scriptures said, their flock. But it was only their flocks because they was watching somebody else's flock. It, it really wasn't their flocks. The sheep that they were watching really belonged to the temple. The, their, their sheep was sheep that people would bring in when they make a sacrifice uh, to the altar. They weren't ready to kill them, so the shepherds had the responsibility of watching the sheep until it was time for the sheep to be sacrificed. Oh, you'll get the picture here in a moment. But watch this. The shepherd them says, although they were watching, catch this, they were watching uh, sheep for the temple was forbidden to go into the temple because the shepherds was considered unclean, outcast, and unreliable witnesses. In, in, in other words, they were men that had no credibility. Right. And that was all by design. Because the message of the gospel came to people that had no credibility. It, it came to somebody that didn't have a reputation. Someone of no importance. Because my first point, the message of the cross is an imitation. The message of the manger is an imitation for all. Write that down. That's the first thing that you want to take away. It was an imitation for all. Christ made it a possible that whether you're rich, poor, black, or blue, you could come to know Christ. I, I, I wish y'all to catch that. Amen. Now notice, it says, uh, now there was in the same country sheep, uh, shepherds, because the shepherds really had nothing to offer to him. You know, it's like you invited, but you have nothing to offer. Him. And I'm glad they had nothing to offer him because it let me know that you can come as you are. You don't have to have, amen, to come to Christ. You can just come yourself. That's why the Bible says in Romans, the 12th chapter, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present the only thing that we can ever give God that matter is our lives. Nothing you possess and you offer to him, he's impressed. 
He's only impressed when you offer yourself. Because if you offer yourself, you'll offer everything you have. Come on, somebody. I, I'm, te- I, I'm trying to pull the message of the, of the manger out here. It says, now they were in the same country. In other words, they were in the same country in which Christ was born. Living out in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. In other words, they were carrying out their occupation and they were interrupted. Watch this. God knows how to interrupt every one of us. Regardless of what you've got going on, he knows how to get your attention. Come on, somebody. Uh huh. I- I'm trying to give you a different perspective of this. Uh huh. Now, read on. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. Uh huh. Stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. Uh huh. And they were greatly afraid. Uh huh. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Yes. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, Uh which will be to all people. Uh Hold it, it should be to whom? You remember I said the message, the number one message, we are all what? Invited. In other words, amen, the message of the manger is we are all invited. We are all invited. Everybody say we are all invited. Uh huh. Don't think that it's for anyone special, but every one of us are special in his eyes. Uh huh. Read on. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. In other words, uh, there is born unto you reject, outcast, unreliable witness. There is born to you this day in the city of David. A Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Uh Uh-huh. Read. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Now, notice the word manger appeared twice in the passage that we have read because there's a message of the manger. There's a message. Because I I really believe that the manger or the nativity scene is not just a part of Christmas, but I believe it's the heart of Christmas. Amen. But we have made the heart of Christmas about Santa Claus, about the North Pole, about, amen, ales and all of those things where Christ should be the heart of Christmas. His birth, amen, the nativity scene is a reflection of, of his birth. See, the message of the manger is a reminder to us of everything that God has done in our lives. And what's this? I believe the reason that the scene of the angel of the manger is open or there is openness so that everyone can what? Come. Amen. He makes it possible for all the world to come to know him because at the heart of it all is God. I said at the heart of it all is God. So the first thing that we want to take away from the manger scene is we are all invited. Look at your neighbor and say, we're all invited. Because when we look at the shepherds in the, in the peep in those days, the shepherds was really nobody. They were rejected by the religious leaders. They wasn't thought of very highly. But yet, God allowed the message of Jesus to come first to the nobody. So that they can tell anybody about somebody that can save everybody. Come on, somebody. That was a purpose. Amen. And that was the purpose. Come on, somebody. Because they had good news. Because they were outcasts, but yet they were bidden to come by the angel and to encounter 
Christ the Lord before anybody else. Matter of fact, I submit to you that the shepherds was the first evangelists. Let, let, uh, verse 15 and read the verse number 18. All we're doing is letting the scripture define itself. Amen. Let's look at it. Come on. Uh, I'm not here to, I'm trying to get you to think right now. Amen. Verse 15. And we're going to read down to 18. If we can pick it up at verse 15. Glory be to God. So Amen. It, so it was when the angels had gone away from them in uh -huh. heaven that the shepherds said to one another. Notice that after the angel left them, after they heard the message, they said to one another, come on. Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass. Uh-huh. Which the Lord has made known to us. Stop. They said, let us now go to Bethlehem. I need you to catch this. And see the thing that has come to pass. And this is what you need to underline. Which the Lord has made known to us. In other words, God gave them a first-hand experience and encounter of the Savior. In other words, it was made unto them. You'll never share him with others until he's made known to you. The reason so many don't share Christ is that he has not been made known to them. When he's made known to you, you're willing to share him with somebody else. Anybody you don't know, you won't share them. But people that you know, you will share them. Now, watch this. Watch this. Go ahead. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Uh-huh. Where did they find them? Three times we've seen the word what? In other words, there's a message there. They came and they made haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe Lying in a manger, just like the angels told them. Uh-huh, come on. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. Hold it. Now when they bared witness of what was told to them by the angel, verse 17, they, it says they what? Made, past tense, known, they made widely known the sin which was told them concerning Christ. In other words, once they bared witness of it, they went out and they started telling others. The question is, who have you told? Who have you told? Or who are you telling? Or has it become so traditional? That you're not telling anyone else about Christ. Uh huh. Next verse. Watch this. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. A question Did they marvel because of the message they heard, or did they marvel because of who told them? Think, think about it. Here's somebody that was an outcast, somebody that was a reject. Someone that was uh, an unreliable witness. When they heard it, they marveled. They marveled, I think, because of what they heard. This is one time they didn't factor in who the shepherds were. They factor in the message. Here's my point. When you have a genuine, heart-convicted message from Christ, people are not looking at you. They are impressed by what you are sharing. In other words, they are not even concerned about you as much as what you are sharing with them. Because I believe, first of all, the, the shepherds was rejects. They were outcasts. If they were bold enough to go in and share Christ's birth, that means that it had an impact on their lives and now they are sharing him from a perspective of their personal conviction. Here's my point. Until you're convicted of the message, you'll never share it with the conviction. 
when you're convicted of the message, you'll share it with conviction. I, I think a lot of people don't receive from us because we have no conviction about what we're sharing. We're just sharing the letter and not from a heart convicted. In other words, when you're convicted of who he is and you share him in com with conviction, it'll convict other people. Oh, I'm not telling you what somebody told me. I'm telling you what I know personally. Come on, somebody. But my first point, watch this. First point is the message of the manger is an imitation to whom? All. Not only the poor, but also the rich. Let's go to Matthew. And let's look at the wise men. Let's look at the wise men, because here's what we need to recognize, and I'm really going to mess with some of your theology now. The wise men was not Christians. They were pagan. They follow zodiac, astrologies. They studied the stars. They're seeking the king of Israel was not out of a heart of conviction, but out of something they had been told. Do you not know in America right now, we got a lot of archaeologists that go in and study out Christianity, but they're not even a Christian. Because they're curious. Well, these men was coming out of curiosity. They had heard over the years about a savior, about a king of the Jews that was supposed to be born. But God strategically set him up to come to know the savior. He put a star before their eyes. And then I'm going to really mess you up. They didn't show up when Jesus was in a manger. Jesus wasn't even a baby when they showed up. He was a child and they wasn't in the manger anymore. They were in the house. Oh, I'm going to prove it to you. And some of you are saying you're messing up Christmas. No, I'm just trying to get you. I'm just trying to get some clarity to you. Now, watch this. So let's pick it up in Matthew, the second chapter, verse 1 and 2, Travis, and then we're going to skip over to verse number 9 through verse number 11. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. So, what do we know thus far? He's already born. It says, now, it says, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, uh -huh, in the days of Herod the king, uh -huh, behold, wise men from the east came See, to Jerusalem. wise men came from the east. If you do a study, they had been traveling almost two years. They, they had been traveling in search of him for almost two years. Uh-huh. Read. Saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? See, they didn't talk like somebody knew it. Knew it. They said, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his what? Star. In the east and have what? See, now, in those days, when you go before king, you never went before king empty-handed. So it wasn't so much that they were coming to present gifts as we know, but they were coming to present gifts because he was the king. Do y'all know that in the Bible, you never went to see a prophet without bringing a gift? When Elijah was sought out, when uh, Saul found him and his servant, the first thing they did, they offered him sin. You can see it scripture. Amen. So, biblically, when you in pursuit of a king and you arrive, you bring gifts. Okay? So they came to worship. They came to worship because he was a king. Uh-huh. 
when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. Why would Herod was troubled because somebody was getting ready to replace him. For the sake of time, skip over to verse number nine. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now he's no longer a babe, but he's a what? Uh-huh, come on. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Uh-huh. And when they had come into the house. Stop. When they come into the what? The house. Not main. When they came into the house. Uh-huh. They saw the young child. Not baby, but young child. With Mary, his mother. And Mary's mother. And fell down and worshipped him. Fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him. Now, guess what you don't see there? You don't see three kings. You see three gifts and you make an assumption that that was three kings. And here's what you have to recognize. Kings in those days had a caravan. They didn't even carry their own stuff. They had people to carry what they possessed. So therefore, it could have been 10. It could have been 20. But we assume that it was three because of the gifts. First of all, gold. You always present a king with gold, which is symbolic, symbolic to royalty. So that was a proper gift for the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But also they presented frankincense. Frankincense was an incense that was burnt and released a fragrant. Watch this. It was released as a fragrant when someone was suffering and going through. It was to soothe them and to calm them. And then the last gift was myrrh. Myrrh was beaten down and broken up. It was more of a ointment that was prepared for burial. In other words, it was given when one died and put up on them to help embalm. So all three gifts represent our king. Because he came truly as the king of kings. But he came to suffer for our sin and our redemption. And ultimately he would die and be buried, but he rose the third day. So all three gifts that they presented was very appropriate to his identity. Are, are, are y'all seeing this? I, I, I am challenging you to look at this thing different. Amen. Because it's not about what we can give one another, but it's about what God gave us through him. So the wise man I told you, so point number one, all is embodied. So when we look at it, not only did the shepherds come representing the poor, but the wise men came representing the rich. The invitation is unto all, whether you rich, poor, blind, crippled, it makes no difference, black, white, the open invitation of the manger is for all people. Are y'all seeing it? In other words, it's a beautiful picture. This manger is because it's in the it's in the puppet. Because think about the shepherd. The shepherd had been working with sheep so long that they stunk like sheep. They had a sheep odor, but yet they were welcome to come. What is it saying? Even when people don't dress like you dress, if they're homeless, we should open ourselves up and receive them. Why is it that we turn up our nose to people that have an order when they come to church? Maybe that's all they have. And if God allowed the stinky shepherds to come in smelling like sheep and had an order, why not embrace a person? Because the good thing about coming to Jesus, you come as you are, but he don't let you leave the same way you come. Oh, 
more, more. Woo! Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Amen. So watch this. Look, look, look at uh, 2 Peter 3 and 9 right fast. 2 Peter 3 and 9. And then let's go to Titus 2 and 1. Amen. And then Romans uh, 10 and 13. Uh, I'm almost there. Almost there. Are you getting anything out of this? Amen. Let's look at it because here's the thing that you need to know. He come to know Jesus came so that we can all know him. Amen. For our sins. And what says you don't have to get cleaned up, cleaned up before you come. You come just as you are. Amen. How do I know that? Look at 2 Peter 3 and 9, Ella Travis. Read it, son. 2 Peter 3 and 9. 2 Peter 3 and 9. 2 Peter 3 and 9, what does it say? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, Jesus came, and watch this, just like he was patient with you, He's patient with your loved one. He's patient with everyone. God is long-suffering towards us all, not willing that no man should perish, but all. See, his invitation is unto who? All. But that all should what? Come to repentance to know him for themselves. Amen. Now go to, go to uh, Titus 2 and 11. Titus 2 and 11. Titus 2 and 11. I told you the imitation is to all. Titus 2 and 11. What does it say right there? It says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto who? All. Woo! See, the imitation is unto who? All. Amen, all. Now go to Romans, the 10th chapter, and verse 13. Amen. Just trying to work through this. Are y'all getting anything out of this? Amen. Romans 10 and 13. Romans 10 and 13. For, it's, go ahead, Elder Travis. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, he's after us all. Look at his neighbor say, the message of the manger is an imitation to all. But also, we can come as we are. That's my second point. Amen. The imitation is to us all, but we can come as we are. In other words, we can come as we are. Write this down. The imitation was not because of who they were or what they had to offer, but the imitation was because of who he was and what he had to offer to them. Here's, 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 here's what you got to realize. He didn't let the wise man come first. He, he let the shepherds come first. Because they didn't have nothing to offer. Amen. And then he let the wise man come. Because sometimes we think God does what he does because of what we have. But the reality is, it's not about what I have, but what he has to offer. Whoa. God repeat a God. Glory be to God. I'm so glad he did it that way. I'm so glad that he didn't let us have to come and give something. But he came. He came. That what we have. Amen. Oh, boy. Somebody better catch this. Because you need to let people know. I don't care if you ain't got nothing to give him. It's all right. Because he don't want what you have. He wants you. Oh, yeah. Look at somebody and say, he don't want. Or better than that, he don't need. What you have. He wants you. Write this down. You are not here because of how good you are. No, you're here because of how good he is. In other words, he don't want what you have. And then what says, he ain't here for you because you've been so good. Because neither the wise men 
or the shepherd had been so good, but he wanted to get the message to somebody that was shared with everybody. Because watch this. Herod told the wise men, when you find him, come back and tell me so I can go and offer gift to him. But it was a liar. But when they saw him, when they witnessed him, the Bible said the Holy Ghost led them out another way. Amen. So they can continue to show. See, the Bible said, cast not your pearls upon swine where they will trotting all over. My God, don't you know to know Jesus is good. Tracy, it's good. It's good to know Jesus for yourself. The old folks would say, I tried him. And I found them to be all right. Look at somebody and say, I tried him. And I found them to be all right. Be all right. Be all right. Be all right. Be all, oh my. Oh, y'all going to make somebody preach in here. Amen. Glory be to God. I'm so glad. We used to sing a song in the choir. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm Jesus I'm so glad it did me singing glory. Jesus it did me. I, Jesus it did me. I'm so glad Jesus it did me. I'm so glad. Singing glory, hallelujah, Jesus lifted. How many Jesus done lifted, done brought you up out of that Nick and Mara? How many that Jesus have changed your life? Let me just cut across the field. Not only is the imitation to all, not only can we come as we are, but there's no way you going to come and enter his presence and your life doesn't change. The last step is we can come into his presence. When they came into the manger, they came into his presence. They came into the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. When the wise man showed up at his house, they came into his presence. When the shepherds showed up in the manger, they came into his presence. When you, when you get saved, you come into his in other words, David said, enter into his presence with thanksgiving into your heart and enter into his courts with praise. Watch this, watch this. Watch this. Why do we need to enter into his presence? Because it is in his presence that our lives are changed. I said, when we enter You'll never enter into his presence and leave out the same way you came. Yvonne, the wise man was changed. The shepherds was changed. And how did they get changed? They entered into the presence of the king of kings and the lord of lords. 
and just in his presence. Their lives was changed because this, what's this? It is in worship that we're able to lose our sense. Remember, the shepherds came to worship him. Remember, the wise man came to worship. And guess what? In the midst of worshiping, they lost themselves. Amen. They lost their says. And they began to see, amen, themselves for who they really were. There's no way you're going to come in his presence and remain as you were. That's why I love, I love St. Matthew, the 11th chapter, and I'm going to close there, and verse 28 through 30. I love what Jesus says. He said we can come into his presence. But he says, come unto me. Oh, ye that are weary and laden. Matter of fact, go there. I want everybody to lay hands on it. Amen. That's uh, St. That's Matthew 11, chapter, verse 28 through verse number 30. Amen. So the, the message of the manger is, number one, we are all what? Number two, we can. And number three, we come into his what? Now notice what it says, Ella Travis. Go ahead, son. Come to me. Hold it. Who? Come to me who? Hold hold it. Stop. Come to me who? So who can't come? I don't care what your background. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what other people think about you. I don't care how many times you miss it. The Bible says, come to me all. All who? You. Uh Uh-huh, all you. Who labor and Uh are heavy laden. And I will what? Give you rest. Folks, there's no rest like coming into the presence of the Almighty. There ain't no rest. There is not a rest like coming into his presence. 